Perfect. Thanks, Julio, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you for coming today to this talk. Uh, and I'm going to uh, briefly talk about uh, the research that I've been uh, basically doing for the last two years, which, uh, as you can see, the title of the talk is Towards integrate, uh, integ Integrated Optical Frequency Synthesizers. And uh, it's, 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 it's also part of that DARPA project that Mohammed mentioned. And uh, we are still working on it. But this is basically the progress that we, had and we have had so far. Uh, first, I'll talk about frequency synthesizers. What is a frequency synthesizer? And uh, why is it important? And why we need frequency synthesizer? Then I, uh, I'll show you some examples of applications of electrical frequency synthesizers versus optical frequency synthesizers. Uh, I'll talk about integration, which is one of the main parts and main uh, goals of our project to have integrated systems as small as possible. Uh, and what, what would be the advantages of that? Uh, then well, in order to integrate and demonstrate uh, optical frequency synthesis, uh, what are the challenges and what we need? And what, what is our proposal? What, what have we done, basically? So a frequency synthesizer is simply a system that generates or, in other words, synthesizes an arbitrary signal, a signal with arbitrary frequency. So uh, it's a block that uh, generates a signal with some frequency that you have accurate control over. Uh, why is it important? <coughs> so if you look at many, almost all uh, communication standards, wired or wireless, uh, you can see that there, there is a frequency synthesizer. In Bluetooth, these are wireless examples, Wi-Fi, LTE, uh, optical fiber communication. We have all this. Let's look at Wi-Fi, for instance. Uh, suppose that we have a router that wants to generate, uh, a, I mean, send a signal to a mobile, mobile device, like, like a cell phone or a smartphone. So this is the router, sends a signal. And uh, basically, the way that the sing signal is uh, encoded and sent is that we are using an RF frequency, uh, radio frequency, uh, different, th th that has different channels. And we can send our data. <coughs> using any of these channels. So you can see we have different channels here with different frequencies. This one is, for example, at 5180 uh, megahertz. The other one is, uh, for example, 5785 megahertz. So different frequencies. And our device, our handheld device, should be capable of receiving the signal at any of these frequencies, basically. So in order to do that, what we do is that the, the communication, the wireless communication, is done in one of these frequencies, a, a high, high frequency, so-called radio frequency. But when the device receives the signal and wants to pro process this, uh, the data, for instance, uh, it could be a video, it could be a file, or anything, it first needs to down convert the, the received signal to baseband frequencies, to lower frequencies. Then our signal processor, or DSP, or whatever that the device has, can process the signal. In order to do that down conversion, we need to basically have a block, which is the frequency synthesizer, to generate one of these frequencies that the router is sending the data uh, at, basically. Because the router can choose. Uh, at, at each time, may, may, may choose this frequency, or this frequency, or this frequency. We, may, we have to be able to uh, tune the uh, down conversion frequency in our device in order to receive the correct signal. That uh, uh, the, uh, the frequency tuning is done uh, using that frequency synthesizer that I talked about. Let's look at um, another application, uh, an application called gas spectroscopy. So suppose we have a chamber like this, uh, and then uh, the chamber has an input and an output. Uh, the gas basically goes into this chamber uh, could be composed of different types of gases. Then it can go out from this valve. 
What we do is that while the gas is inside the chamber, you can have a laser just emitting light, laser as uh, uh, you heard before, it's a uh, uh, device that generates light at a certain frequency. Uh, so there is a light with a certain frequency going into the chamber, and there is a receiver on the other side of the chamber. Uh, <clears throat> what happens is that different gases, based on the composition, based on the elements that they have, have different absorption frequencies, which means that if you, if, for example, let's pick one of these, which is at, uh, the, the peak has, uh, is at uh, four micron wavelength. If you emit a light at that specific wavelength, most of the energy will be absorbed by the gas. So on the other side of the chamber that we have receiver, the receiver won't uh, basically detect anything. But at other frequencies, uh, because that, that this black gas uh, doesn't have any absorption, we, we receive a high power. So basically, if we can have a laser and then change its wavelength from this, this number to this number continuously, and look at this, the signal received by this receiver, we can basically determine at what wavelengths we have the highest absorption and as a result we can uh, understand or we can figure out what are the different types of gases that we have inside the chamber because we already have this uh, lookup table or graph that we look at it if we have high absorption that at this wavelength uh, we say okay we have this type of gas it's at lower wavelengths we have that type. so in order to do this, as I said, we have to basically generate a light, a signal, and control its wavelength, or in other words, frequency, accurately, and sweep that frequency over a specified uh, range, and then look at the output of, output of our system. So here also, our, res our oscillator, our signal generator is optical signal generator. It's a laser. The output is not uh, electrical, like what I said about Wi-Fi uh, example. But this is also an, uh, basically oscillator that we need to have control over the frequency. So this is also some sort of frequency synthesizer. It's optical frequency synthesizer because it's a block that we can basically uh, control its frequency, which is very much higher than our radio frequencies. It's optical, but it's still we can synthesize different frequencies. So these are uh, these two are basically two. Uh, examples of uh, frequency synthesizers and one, why they're important and how we can use them. Uh, but <clears throat> the, the optical frequency synthesizers exist and uh, uh, people have done that before. But uh, all the implementations were so-called benchtop, which means that in a lab like this picture, uh, which is a famous work, uh, this is an optical synthesizer. You can see the scale of this, this picture. This is, if this is 25 centimeter, you can see how big this is. So uh, it works really well, but the problem is that you cannot use it wherever you want because, first of all, it's high power. It's very large. Uh, and certainly, it's expensive. So it's difficult to use it in different applications and different places. So if we can integrate the whole thing, and make it a smaller like this chip, uh, or a, f a couple of these chips. Basically, you can s you can compare the scale of these two. So this is a millimeter. This is many centimeters. So orders of magnitude a smaller uh, system can be uh, implemented. The cost would be a lot uh, lower because right now we have access to fabrication processes, semiconductor fabrication processes that. You can have thousands or millions of these chips for, for, relatively, for a relatively low cost compared with this benchtop uh, implementation. Uh, as I said, the power consumption would be a lot less. And uh, it's easier to use it in different systems like mobile systems. Uh, so I talked about the Wi-Fi. If you want to have some, uh, for some sort of application, just assume that you want to have the optical frequency synthesizer in a handheld or mobile device then uh, obviously this is not a solution. So you have to integrate. So this is the uh, <clears throat> motivation. And uh, as of now, no one has integrated such a system, fully integrated such a system on, uh, like this, basically using integrated circuits. So this is the motivation behind our work. So we are trying to 
design and implement a fully integrated optical synthesizer, frequency synthesizer uh, that can be used for various applications as I, as I talked about. So <clears throat> what do we need for that? Uh, as I said, let's, let's look at the gas spectroscopy example. I said we need a laser that we move its wavelength and then look at the receiver to see how much light we're absorbing and then figure out what type of gas we have in the chamber, right? So in order to do that, we need a laser that is first of all tunable, which means that you can tune, you can change the frequency of the laser continuously over a specified range. Could be large, could be small, it depends on the application. It should be a stable, <clears throat> which means that the frequency of the laser doesn't move with time. Uh, uh, you saw in the previous uh, presentation uh, that how much a, uh, the frequency of the laser can change. For instance, in gas spectroscopy, if, you, if the frequency is just mo moving con uh, continuously, what happens is that you cannot receive a valid signal at the output of the uh, system because <clears throat> you have a certain type of gas, but the frequency of the laser is moving, so uh, your received signal is not, is not also a valid uh, uh, signal. We cannot uh, figure out the type of gas perfectly. So this is also important, so the frequency should not move. Also, it should be clean, it should be low noise. What do we uh, mean by, uh, by uh, saying it should be low noise? So in frequency domain, if you have a uh, sinusoidal uh, signal, it's, 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 like a, it's like a delta function, right? It's very extremely, not basically, uh, infinitely uh, narrow. But in practice, what happens is that the oscillator, any kind of oscillator, could be uh, electrical oscillator, optical oscillator, like lasers, they are also emitting a light or signal at a certain frequency, but that, but that certain frequency is not perfectly constant. So it has some variations. So you can see that uh, as the oscillator or laser becomes more noisy, we, we move towards this, this graph. So it becomes wider and wider in frequency domain. So we don't, need, we don't want this because, again, let's look at gas spectroscopy. Let's, let's assume that we have two gases with absorption wavelengths very, very close to each other. So if you have that, if, if the laser's line width is, uh, basically the laser is noisy and it's wide in frequency domain, basically you are exciting two types of gas, gases at the same time, which is not what we want. So we want, we want the laser, the, the spectrum of the uh, laser, in other, in other words, the frequency of the laser to be as narrow as possible. What happens in practice is that if, if, if you have all these three in a laser, we're done. Basically, uh, the, the problem is solved. We have a laser which is tunable, stable, and clean. We can do many applications. But uh, the problem is that you, we cannot achieve all these three uh, criteria at the same time. We, have, we can have a very tunable laser, largely tunable laser, which is relatively stable, but it's not clean. We can have a very clean laser, very low noise laser, but it's not tunable. We cannot move it. It's just constant. It's just fixed at a specified wavelength. So uh, that's the problem. So uh, we, are, we are looking to solve the problem uh, by using a laser, which is tunable, this guy, which we call it a slave tunable laser. It's relatively stable, and, uh, but it's noisy. Uh, if, if you look at the spectrum of the laser, it's very wide, as I showed in the previous uh, slide, which is not desirable. So, but, but we can do one thing. We can use it as a slave laser and use another laser as a reference laser, which is very, very uh, clean and very stable, but it's not tunable. It's just fixed at a specified wavelength. We can use a, a system called phase dark loop. In this system, we have a reference laser. As I said, it's very clean. It's very stable. We have our slave laser, which is tunable. We can, we can tune the wavelength. So what we do is that we, uh, using this loop, we can uh, lock the phase of uh, this slave tunable laser to, to, to the reference laser. In other words, the phase noise, the spectrum of the laser after closing this loop would look like this guy. Would be sharp, clean, and uh, basically stable. 
So if I close the loop, so this is this is basically the uh, the slave laser. It's at a certain frequency, its own frequency. TL means tunable laser. This is F reference. Then when I close the loop, what happens is that this this tone becomes sharp, becomes uh, less noisy. How is it done? It's basically this error detection block looks at the difference between these two. If there is any error, uh, it generates a signal that in the laser driver or error correction block, basically, which is connected to the laser can correct for the error that exists. So as the you go around the loop, uh, many times this, this guy becomes fat, uh, uh, thinner and thinner instead of being noisy. So it becomes less noisy. And then we have one more knob here, which is called frequency fine tuning. By using this frequency fine tuning, you can move the frequency of the laser but by a certain amount. So we have achieved what we want. So we needed a tunable laser, which we could, uh, if we had a tunable laser, we can uh, tune it with this uh, frequency fine tuning knob. We need it to be stable and clean. And because it's locked to this reference laser, it's stable and clean. So all those three uh, requirements are met using this, uh, this architecture. But there is a problem here. Uh, as I said, that depending on the application, we may want to move the wavelength of the laser for a specified range. Could be megahertz, could be gigahertz, could be terahertz, different ranges depending on the application. In our specific uh, project, we are looking for a, a tunable laser that you can f tune it for 5 terahertz, which is 5, 10 to the 12 uh, hertz. But using this architecture, you can, uh, let's say you can just tune it for 500 megahertz. So there is 10,000, there is a factor of 10,000, so four orders, orders of magnitude uh, difference. What we can do, uh, uh, what, what can we solve this problem? So. For 500 megahertz, we're okay. We have we can tune the laser for 500 megahertz. For but beyond that, we cannot do that with this architecture. So our pro uh, proposal uh, to solve this problem is that let's use something called f optical frequency comb. Optical frequency comb is something like this. So if you look at the frequency spectrum of the uh, of a of a laser of a single frequency laser, there is only one of these tones, right? Sine of omega naught t. There's only one tone. But this optical frequency comb is somehow generated that if you look at the spectrum of the, uh, the laser, you see multiple tones equally spaced. So in this, is, in, in this specific example, if you look at this, I have 14 tones which are uh, similar. The spacing is 500 megahertz. So, if, if I use this as a reference, what can I do? Let's assume I, I said that with the previous structure, I only can tune the frequency of the laser for 500 megahertz. So I, for 500 megahertz, I'm good. So if I want to do it for 5.8 gigahertz, what happens? I can write 5.8 gigahertz as this, 11 times 500 megahertz plus 300 megahertz. So if I go 11, 500 megahertz, and then 300 megahertz, I can cover 5.8 gigahertz. Let's see what we can do. So this is the uh, initial frequency of the laser. It's here, right? Just randomly, I just put it there. Uh, then what I do is that, and this is our final frequency. It should be here. So if, if the spacing is 500 megahertz, you can see that you have, you should go to this point to get 5.8 gigahertz tuning. So during a step called coarse tuning, what we do is that we go for 11, 500, 11 times 500 megahertz. So this moves for 11, uh, 11 to, uh, teeth basically, as we call it. These are teeth of the frequency comb. So we have uh, moved the laser for 11 teeth. So the frequency tuning have, uh, so far is 5.5 gigahertz, 11 times 500. Then we have a fine tuning step. We can change the frequency by 300 megahertz. So basically, using these two steps, we could uh, be able to uh, tune, the five, uh, tune the laser for 5.8 gigahertz, although our phase lock loop that I showed in previous slide only is capable of only moving the laser for 500 megahertz. <clears throat> so this is what we proposed. And uh, using this technique, 
you can have, this, this, this picture only shows 14 teeth, but you can have thousands of teeth. And then instead of going for 11, you can go for 1,000 uh, teeth, and then you can, let's say, tune the uh, frequency of the laser for 500 gigahertz instead of 5 gigahertz. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this is, this is what we did. This is the actual uh, uh, block diagram of our, our, our system. Uh, basically, this is our reference laser, which I showed you this is a frequency comb instead of being a single frequency laser. We have a slave tunable laser. We look at the difference. We process that signal. Uh, this, this path does the fine tuning. This path does the coarse tuning, just counts for, uh, in, in previous example, 11 teeth. And then you inject the error signal to the uh, slave laser so we can tune it for, for any range that we are uh, looking for. And then what we did is that we just integrated this whole system uh, except for this uh, course tuning, this, this part. So we have optical structures, photonic structures, we have electrical components, we have amplifiers, we have mixers, different things. Then the whole thing is on a single chip, which is uh, a one by two millimeters in, in dimension. So if you, can, if you want to implement it on, uh, basically in a lab using benchtop implementation, it would be um, much, much larger and much more uh, power hungry. <coughs> uh, so just to show you what happens in uh, practice, these are actual measurements, uh, very similar to previous slide that I showed you. This is the frequency comb. There are many, many uh, teeth uh, that is generated as our reference laser. Our, uh, it may be difficult to see, uh, but this is our tunable laser. It's, this is the initial position or frequency of the tunable laser with respect to the comb. And then we want to go to this frequency, as, as I showed you. This is more number of teeth. In, instead of 11 teeth, this is, uh, I think, 25 teeth. So 25 times 500, it's about 12 gigahertz instead of 5 gigahertz. Then what happens is that the laser is here. We start the process very fast. It, it goes to the, ne to the next position. So. In this, in the, this picture, basically, this is the electrical spectrum of the laser. You can see it's much sharper. If, if you don't do what I said, basically, you, you see something very broad, which means that the laser is very noisy. But after doing this, the laser is uh, locked to this very sharp comb teeth. And then as you uh, move the laser through these comb teeth, it remains locked, phase locked, in that, uh, that I showed you, and becomes stable. Uh, uh, less noisy and then tunable. Uh, so this is what we have done so far. Uh, obviously, in order to have fully optic, fully integrated optical synthesizer, we are still uh, working on it. There are other uh, blocks that, need, uh, that we need to integrate. We need to make chips. But the main part of the synthesizer, which was the phase lock loop that I showed you, has already been integrated. And uh, this is basically how it works. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I would be happy to take your questions. If there is any question. Yes. So when you have the frequency comb, right? You have to be able to assume that all of those comb lines are stable, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so That's right. So uh, that's a good point. Uh, I should have mentioned that this work is, in, uh, is, is a work in collaboration with other institutions. Uh, what we have done was mainly uh, stabilizing a tunable laser and locking, into, into, uh, locking the laser to this frequency comb. But you, uh, you had the right point. We, we should have a very stable frequency comb as the reference, which is basically done by our collaborator, uh, University of Central Florida. But yes, so generation of that comb has a separate, pro uh, separate uh, process and separate, basically, project. So there are, uh, but in a nonlinear process, you can generate, because as I said, a laser has a single frequency. But um, using some techniques, which are mostly nonlinear uh, 
uh, uh, nonlinear blocks, you can the input is single frequency and the output is uh, is a wide range of frequencies. Basically, if you look at the this is in frequency domain that you see all these tones. In time domain, you see pulses. So the Fourier transform of a pulse in time domain, uh, in frequency domain, is basically very wide and consists of many tones. Yes. So generation of the frequency comb is uh, a different process, and uh, we are assuming that we have a very stable and very stable comb, which means that none of these guys move. Also, they are very clean as well. We are assuming that we have that, and then based on that, we can generate our tunable signal. Yes. Uh, so basically, right now, the output of this system, as I said, it's a tuner. We are tuning a laser. In our specific design, the output uh, frequency of the laser is hundreds of terahertz. It's very large because uh, in this. Yeah. So. This is the output of this laser, is the very output of our system. So the, the frequency of our system, that, uh, the, the output frequency of the system depends on the frequency of this laser, which in this case is hundreds of terahertz, it's 200 terahertz. But yes, if you replace this tunable laser and replace this uh, reference laser with uh, a frequency that you like for, for any application, it could be, instead of 200 terahertz, it could be one terahertz. This, this loop still works. Because what, it, what, this, what, this, what this loop does is that it locks the uh, slave tunable laser to a reference laser, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> that you can choose the frequency. So by choosing a right reference frequency, you can generate your, the, the, uh, the desired frequency. It could be gigahertz range, could be, but basically this architecture can be implemented in RF domain as well. It could be fully electrical. This, Electri these uh, oscillators could be electrical oscillators. So in that case, our synthesizer op uh, operates in gigahertz or megahertz range. But right now, because we are using optical oscillators, optical resonators like lasers and this, this uh, frequency, reference frequency, it operates at very high frequency. But yes, it can be, depending on uh, uh, how you choose the reference, it can operate at different frequencies. So in this specific case, the, frequencies of, the frequency of this laser is very close to this frequency. So I showed you that before locking, the frequency is FTL, right? But, uh, and then I said that we have a frequency fine-tuning knob. Right? That, that frequency fine-tuning knob, what it does is that it sets the frequency difference between these two lasers. If this, this fine-tuning knob is set to zero, this FTL would be equal to F ref, F uh, reference, right? If I increase this frequency to tuning knob, basically this guy moves as I show. See, if you turn the knob, the laser goes the other way. So uh, when they are phase locked, it means that if you look at the spectrum of the laser, the phase, uh, the phase noise behavior or phase basically behavior of the uh, slave laser follows that of reference laser, which means that it becomes narrow. But the frequency difference can be set using this architecture. But how it's done, basically it's, uh, 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 you, as I said, you have to compare these two, generate an error signal, process it and, uh, like, like any, any feedback loop process and, uh, and uh, inject it back to the laser to compensate for the error that exists. Thank you.